CNIB, a century of service, marking a milestone in advocating for Canada's blind and partially sighted community. Welcome to CNIB, a century of service. I'm Laura Bain on the Halifax waterfront, and along with my colleagues from across the country, we want to celebrate 100 years of CNIB creating programs, providing services, and advocating to change the lives of people with sight loss. We'll even take a look at the future with the arrival of some adorable puppies for a new guide dog training program. But first, a Halifax history lesson and the story of how a major disaster helped trigger the founding of the CNIB. December 6, 1917, Halifax Harbour, a Norwegian warship known as the SS Emo, accidentally collides with a French munition ship called the SS Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc catches fire. The fire rages for 20 minutes, then without warning, Mont Blanc explodes. Dr. Roger Marsters, curator of marine history at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic, explains the impact on the city. The explosive force was enormous. The geographical effects of the blast were felt most uh, strongly in the north end of the city. The effects uh, on that part of the city were similar to the sorts of things that you saw on the uh, western front of the Great War. Um, the, just total devastation, uh, structures completely uh, gone uh, and uh, the, uh, the trees just shredded. The museum houses an award-winning exhibit called Halifax Wrecked, devoted to the Halifax explosion. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 people were known to have been killed by the blast, and at least as many as 9,000 um, injured as well. The blast also resulted in a remarkably high number of eye injuries. Over 1,000 people affected by eye injuries. Surgeons, uh, ophthalmologists in the aftermath of the explosion performed a very large number of enucleations of eye removals, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 uh, eye removals. Volunteer curator for the CNIB, Jane Beaumont, says just under 40 people were blinded in the explosion. Most of those injuries happened because children and mothers went to the windows to watch the um, boat that was blazing in the, um, in the harbour, not knowing it was full of very flammable explosives. So about 20 minutes after the collision, the Mont Blanc blew up. And shards of glass were the main reason for people's injury, eye injuries. And it's probably worth saying that many people probably had eye injuries but died of other things. The injuries that resulted from the explosion raised public awareness about blindness at a time when resources for the blind were scarce. Well, um, in the early 20th century, it was pretty bad. If you were poor and you didn't have private resources, poverty and, la and no work was probably your future. Only a few even managed to go to schools for the blind and learn Braille and be literate. So it was pretty grim. But around the same time, some light. Plans for a national organization for the blind were already brewing in Toronto. A library had been founded by Edgar and Marion Robinson, and that um, provided Braille books to blind readers in Canada. The library had a board, and that board was realizing that more was needed than the library, that blind people needed quite a lot of other services, and so that library board was beginning the process of creating a national organization. Also lending urgency to the need for more services for the blind was 100 or so World War I veterans returning home after being blinded overseas. In Nova Scotia, they were actually luckier than other parts of the country because there had been a Halifax School for the Blind since the 1870s. And in 1882, the Nova Scotia government actually um, passed legislation to ensure that blind children got free education. The head of the Halifax School for the Blind was Sir Charles Frederick Fraser. Sir Fraser had lost his sight as a child and was educated at the prestigious Perkins School for the Blind in Boston. In the aftermath of the Halifax explosion, he played a pivotal role. He is, to me, the big hero of all of this period for the Maritimes. Sir Frederick Fraser was well positioned to immediately um, start to take care of the people who were blinded. And while many of them were in hospital, he was also calling for them to come to the School for the Blind and register. And he quickly got help from other doctors um, from outside of the Maritimes, um, from, from Boston in particular. Back in Ontario, the men who had become the founding fathers of CNIB lent their support to Sir Fraser. 
The library um, was very short of funds itself, but Sherman Swift, the librarian, wrote to Sir Frederick Fraser, I think on about the 10th of December, very quickly, and said, um, enclosing a check for $100. And then they offered um, all other kinds of assistance. So in fact, they started to provide um, paper and braille, braille equipment and some of the things that were needed for, um, for teaching the, the newly blinded people. Within a matter of months, a national organization dedicated to providing services for the blind was born. And I, I think there's no question that the explosion just lent extra urgency to the founding of CNIB and the need for a national service and a coordinated service for rehabilitation and care of people with vision loss. Up next, we go to Toronto where Jane takes Anthony through 100 years of CNIB archives. Like any organization that reaches the century mark, you end up accumulating a lot of keepsakes. With that in mind, I, Anthony McLaughlin, decided to check out the CNIB's archives here in Toronto to uncover some of their coolest artifacts that they've collected over the years. The archives are housed in a large warehouse with rows of shelving in cages to hold all the items. With so many artifacts to discover, I needed my own personal tour guide to navigate the space. And once again, Jane Beaumont answered the call. Jane is the volunteer curator for the CNIB and is the perfect person to show me around. Well, welcome to our CNIB's off-site storage. It's mostly paper documents, but we have a very special cage here, which is our, um, all the artifacts that we've gathered over our 100 year history, I guess, mm -hmm. and before. And so I'm happy to walk you through and we'll just do a quick tour of some of the major groups. That'd and we'll start with this little statuette of a postman carrying a braille book. In the late 1800s, the Parliament passed an act, Post Office Act, which said that all material for the blind would go mail post free and it's mm -hmm. actually an international treaty now and on the 50th anniversary of that we gave this to Sir William Moolock who was the postmaster back in that late 1800s That's time. That's fantastic. And yeah. we have a great photo on our exhibit of him holding this. Braille was the first way in which people read and wrote of course. and um, we, we found um, it's quite wonderful teaching tools from the 1930s, probably the 1930s, mm -hmm. and, and these holes are the six holes. So there's two rows of four braille cells, Just on as a, we call a them, plank of wood, yeah. on a plank of wood, definitely handmade, and then a set of handmade um, pegs. And so to make a braille letter, you would put the pegs into the holes and a child or anyone learning Braille has got a nice big board that they can work with. Before the Second World War, we started to get what we call Braillers. And th this is really a Braille typewriter. Picked is a German company and they, I, we th I think, uh, produced the first Braillers. And so they, they actually came out in the late 1800s. And the interesting thing about this is it has a carriage like a typewriter which moves from side to side. It's got nice blue case, um, six ivory keys in the same way as every other the brailler and a space bar in the middle and that sends the carriage across. Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. Even when he invented it he saw the value as a possible talking book um, product and so we have a few early examples. We have three boxes here like this one and this is the Holy Bible on, really? on talking books, on, uh, as a talking book. So there's three large cases but yes. how many discs would you say are per case? Oh, I'm not sure but I would guess probably we've got about 150 to 200 discs all together so to yeah. make the Bible. <laughs> and it's an ambitious project considering Very. that these are uh, these record discs are actually quite fragile. Too. Yes, they were a miracle. People um, could start to hear books as well as to read Braille and for people who never learned Braille. But they, these were really not very practical because they break and they scratch and they're being shipped around the country, etc. But vinyl is making a comeback. I so. know. <laughs> <laughs> this was the earliest tape book on tape, and it's actually several books on tape, or it often was. It weighs about nine pounds. It's a metal case, and it's sort of like a D shape um, with a rounded end and a flat back. A reader would receive this at the post office. It's heavy, and it goes into this large machine and clips down like that. And it looks a bit like a phonograph player, but it's, um, it plays the tape. And so that was quite a miracle to, um, to people who had been struggling. Because the discs, you didn't know what order they were in, you, they got out of order. This was a much easier thing to manage. We, the same manufacturer, 
was able to put a book, it's, it's not quite as long as the, that big tape, but they started shipping these. Okay, yeah. Came in a plastic on a plastic package with a zip, and it's a bit, it's sort of a smaller version of a VHS tape, mm -hmm. with um, but with a um, thin audio tape running through it. But it's self-contained in this package, so it's very it's hard to wreck it or to damage it, which was always a problem with the earlier discs. Mm -hmm. Former president Jim Sanders, who has been a user since his childhood, said in the interview with us, it doesn't get better than this. Well, he got, he got another thing coming yeah. now. Got, but this would have been in the 60s. One other fun thing, which was in the 1990s, I'm holding a large teddy bear called Spinoza. And these were for children. And it's a beautiful teddy bear. And if you go to the, its underside <laughs> and unzip it, there's a tape play. there's a Walkman in there oh, nice. for putting a book in and it says Spinoza, the bear who speaks from his heart. And so there's a button on the front and a kid learning to do audio books would turn this button and on would come the tape. That's very neat, it's nice little learning yeah. tool for kids. Yeah. So this is called Spinoza. What we also have here is are a lot of portraits and a lot of mounted photographs. Mm -hmm. um, again, gathered over the years. It's, it's pretty neat to handle all this kind of stuff. I mean, for you personally, because you're it. also well, curating it yourself, right? I, I'm, I'm interested in history, and I'm especially yeah. interested in the history of CNIB. So it that's is very good. Cool. So that's a very a real quick tour through what we have and, and the hundred years of artifacts that we've gathered up and There's found. There's so much here. I might have to come back and kind You'll of. You'll be very well. Yeah. Yes, right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It was really neat to see all that history in one place, and there was so much that we didn't even get to show you. But if you want more information, you can head to the website, thatallmayread.ca. Stay with us, because after the break, Ottawa presenter Shelby Travers heads to Montreal to meet up with Madeline Antonio Sauvé, a CNIB client who has her own very special celebration this year. CNIB, a century of service, will return in a moment. We now return to CNIB, a century of service. Welcome back to CNIB, a century of service. We are celebrating a milestone of an organization that is known to many of our viewers. I'm Ottawa presenter Shelby Travers, and I have traveled to Montreal, Quebec to visit with one of the clients that is very special to the CNIB. Madeline Antonio Sauvé is celebrating her 100th birthday alongside the CNIB. She invites me into her home to discuss books, birthdays, and what the CNIB has done to impact her life. Well, your five senses are very important. Mm -hmm. So when you start losing them, well, it's, it's a tragedy. 16 years ago, Madeline started to lose her sight due to age-related macular degeneration. I live with it, and I always say there's always a solution. A solution, you need more courage. <laughs> As she continued to lose her sight, it altered her plans for retirement. I never had time to read. So uh, I collected books. And uh, now that I could read them, I can't, I can't read. And I find that the most frustrating, you know, <laughs> that I collected all my life mm -hmm. for my old age. And uh, I was planning my old age, mm -hmm. but I didn't expect to live that old, mm -hmm. that's for sure. And it breaks my heart mm -hmm. because I would have loved to read them. Thanks to the CNIB, Madeline now listens to audiobooks on CD in her Daisy Player. The library is a savior because uh, I can get the same thing and uh, what I, I choose, what I like, and uh, what I enjoy reading the most, you want to know? Mm -hmm. Well, philosophy, mm -hmm. for one, and um, biographies, and... Um, uh, medical also interests me. At the Montreal CNIB office, psychosocial and youth program lead Najla Nouri first met Madeline at a drop-in support group. Madeleine is a client who will turn 100 this year. She was born in the same year that the CNIB started in 1918. 
She is a lady who has a fantastic sense of humor and is still very active despite her age. She outlines the CNIB services that appeal to Madeline the most. I know our audiobook collection is something that brings her a lot of joy. She then started coming to our in-person support groups, which allowed her to meet others who have lost their sight. It also allowed her to learn about other services that are available to her and to understand the feelings she was going through with her vision loss. And Madeline appreciates the social aspect of the support group. You always learn something, that's for sure. Nigel shares the significance of having an active 100-year-old client. It's very important because she is a great mentor for others who are younger in the group. It's very inspiring for our members. It shows that it's important to be active and that it is possible regardless of your age or limitation. And Madeline's thoughts on sharing her 100th birthday with the CNIB? Well, I was uh, so surprised because it was the same year. In addition to a family reunion planned for her birthday, Madeline tells me her own annual tradition. Once a year, I, I go to a certain place downtown and I have a nice big piece of cheesecake. Mm. <laughs> and I really, with a coffee, and that's I, that's I celebrate once a year. <laughs> So I'm very reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> I really hope she enjoys that cheesecake. It was such a pleasure meeting with Madeline. Now let's head out west, where we meet with Grant Hardy in Victoria, BC. He's checking out the CNIB Vision Loss Rehabilitation Division. That's right. We headed to Vancouver Island to take a look at the important work that's being done to help people who are dealing with losing their vision. It's a quiet afternoon, and Victoria, B.C. musician Joey Novak practices her passion. Music's really important. I've been a musician for 50 years. I, I need to play, even if it's a little bit, I need to be around other people where I can, you know, play music with. For most musicians, evenings are a special time when live music fills venues and microphones beckon. But going out became a problem when Joey was diagnosed with a progressive degenerative eye condition. I have what's called pellucid marginal degeneration, so I'm extremely nearsighted. So when one person sees one light, my natural vision now sees about 100 and much bigger, and a lot of headaches, which is why I'm wearing these dark glasses and a hat inside. People at the music community were like, why aren't you coming out, Joey? And then I had to start saying, well, I can't really see that well. And they said, well, we'll drive you home. I'm like, well, that's great, but I still can't see to get there. Increasingly isolated and in denial, Joey eventually went to the CNIB looking for a magnifier to help her read. Instead, she found help for far more. I felt really embraced and really validated. The first woman spent time with me and just really acknowledged what I was going through and it was really nice to finally have someone to talk to about it. So one thing I often do is plan my trips. I always have to determine how long it takes to get from one community to another. Orientation and mobility specialist Barbara Schuster was instrumental in helping Joey adapt to her vision loss and in accepting the white cane. I can remember going out with her when I first met her at night and she was really scared. She was really afraid. She was afraid of tripping on the curbs. She was afraid of crossing the streets. And now she's out there with total confidence, letting her cane find those curbs. And also knowing that other people around her, drivers can see the white cane. Orientation and mobility is one of the many services the CNIB offers under Vision Loss Rehabilitation BC. My name is Jennifer Yankana and I'm the manager of programs and services here in British Columbia. Um, one important part that we do is we go into people's homes and help them relearn to live in their surroundings. Uh, we teach them confidence, uh, independence, and so they're able to be um, actively part of the community again. Some people have extremely short-term goals and they just want to learn one type of activity. Someone might want to learn something so simple as pouring a cup of coffee or another person needs to know how to get their lunch prepared for their children. Nothing like a good cup of tea 
to help get through the day. Now to be on the safe side, I always put the cups in the sink before I pour the water in them. Gail Lane is a CNIB client who lost her vision suddenly after contracting Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Being a new blind person, I, I just didn't know exactly how I was going to cope, especially because I was living on my own. And I think that it helped me learn that I was still Gail, the person that I am, and that there is life after blindness, but that it's a, it can be a slow process and to not be judgmental about the progress you think you should be making versus maybe the progress you feel that you are making in reality. According to Barbara, Gail's made good progress adapting to her vision loss. She had been working, she had been driving a car, living independently, and suddenly she had to depend on friends and family. So she was very upset, and it takes a long time to get confident to go out by yourself. So we're still working on that. You feel the down ramp? Yeah, I can feel it. It's you're pretty right in the, you're gonna, about yeah, to walk I'm in the, the street. street. I don't know where I would have been without the CNIB and all the support and help I've gotten from them. And I am thinking a bit in the future about maybe leading a support group myself. Joey is also thankful. These days, she regularly goes out at night. So let's give Joey a gorgeous family round of applause. Here's Joey. Thank you. Including open mic nights at the local cafe. It's giving me hope. I feel like I have something to live for again. Um, I'm getting more used to letting people see me with a cane. I, I, I don't want pity. I don't want pity. You make me happy. The person who I am inside is still here. You know, I hope you see that instead of a cane. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, another hand for Joey. Let's give it up for her. Stay tuned because coming up after the break, we join Alex Smythe in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where he meets the new puppies that are part of the CNIB's National Guide Dog Program that was launched this year in celebration of their 100th year. CNIB, a century of service, will return in a moment. We now return to CNIB, a century of service. I'm Alex Smythe, and the CNIB's 100th anniversary has brought me to Winnipeg, where I meet with Margot Ross, manager of philanthropy with the CNIB, who tells me about a new program they've been working on. I believe we are still a well-kept secret. So unless you are personally touched by sight loss, or a member of your family, I still feel that a lot of Canadians don't know the amazing work that CNIB does. One of the pieces missing was the guide dog program. Clients of CNIB would go to mainly the US, be on a waiting list for quite a long period of time, and finally get matched up with the dog. The cost was prohibitive. They had to travel long distances. And when they came back, they didn't have the ongoing training there's approximately 800 Canadians who are partnered with guide dogs. We know that number would be much higher if the supply was available. It was decided to launch the program in three cities, Toronto, Halifax, and Winnipeg. For the first litters of dogs, we are getting them from a breeder in Canberra, Australia. Watch this. These are the nine pups born for CNIB's first guide dogs. Those puppies are so adorable. So cute. When CNIB provides a guide dog, it will be uh, covering the cost for the lifetime of that dog. From the acquisition of the dog until it retires is, is $50,000. I met with Jim Goche at his car dealership to find out why he felt it was important to sponsor a guide dog. 
I felt that it was a great cause, and it wasn't very easy for people that are blind to get a dog here in Winnipeg. Hi. Hi. I hear the puppies have arrived. Yeah, there's a picture of them there. Oh my God, couldn't they yeah. be any cuter? Aren't they cute, eh? Jim has become the ambassador of our CNIB Winnipeg guide dog program, and he chose to underwrite the full cost of our first guide dog puppy. I had two requirements. One was that it be a female, and the other that it be named Joycey. Now, my wife's name was Joyce, and I thought it'd be a great tribute to her to have the first trained CNI dog here in Winnipeg named after her. I'm here at the airport in Winnipeg, where two of those dogs selected are set to arrive. Andrea Critch, Puppy Raiser Supervisor, and Karen Hanlon, Manager of Canine Development and Training for the CNIB, met the puppies at the airport where they took him outside for a pee break and introduced them to the cold Canadian winter. So what are the next steps for the puppies? What do they get to look forward to? Well, they are uh, going to be raised with their puppy raisers, so their foster families. The puppy raisers will be responsible for looking after them, keeping them safe, and socializing them, and making sure they grow into confident, happy future guide dogs. I will help them settle in for the night, you know, just wear a toilet, uh, feeding routines, and then tomorrow we'll go in and actually do a nice checkup and see how they're doing and how they're settling. We're always looking for puppy raisers, and 11 people were selected out of the 800 that applied. Joycey! What's there? Lorraine Rempel is the puppy raiser for Joycey. She's like having a little baby almost. She's integrated really well. She's very quiet and gets along fantastic with our seven-year-old Beagle. I was fortunate enough to spend some cuddle time with Joycey. As part of her training, I had to sit on the floor because guide dogs aren't allowed on the furniture. I think it's great that they're giving the Canadians and people in all the provinces a little bit more opportunity to find a guide dog within their own province, within their own country. Once paired with a guide dog, they feel as if the boundaries are unlimited. There's such a sense of confidence and optimism by having your best friend at your side day and night. Somebody once told me that they could walk with a cane, but they could fly with a dog. We've traveled coast to coast. We learned about the past, discovered the future, and explored current programs and services. Thank you for joining us for CNIB, a century of service. Now we gotta get back to playing with Joycey here. Presenters Laura Bain, Grant Hardy, Anthony McLaughlin, Alex Smythe, Shelby Travers. Producers Ted Cooper, Ava Carvonen, Lisa No, Wendy Purvis, Amit Tandon. Videographers Darcy DeToni, Patrick Kelly, Matthew McGurk, Andrew Pickup, Sergio Vera Barahona. Integrated Describe Video Specialist Ron Rickford. Editors Andrew Antonello, Mariam Bakhtiar. Audio Post Bruce Baclarian, Achira Karinde, Santiago Moffat, Mark Phoenix. President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2018, Accessible Media Incorporated.